thank you all for coming out on this rainy evening here. Uh, I, my name is Billy Ocasio. I'm the director of the museum here. Just so you know, this has been, you all may know the history of this, but if not, we have a few people here who are going to give you the history of it. Um, but the Puerto Rican community, um, when I was at Alderman, we went to Mayor Daly and, and said we wanted to make a museum out of this. The place had been vacant for decades. Uh, it had been vacant for decades. In the courtyard, there was, they were storing winter salt in it. And I remember growing up in, in the, I grew up on Division Street here, and we used to play fast pitching off of the, the walls of this building. That was the only thing that existed at that time. And so we, um, after seeing it decade for such a long time, I, uh, I became an alderman and between Luis Martinez and Oscar Martinez and their group, we went to the city and said, you know, we really want to make this uh, a museum. Uh, and Mayor Daly said to us, you know, let's go ahead and work on it. Uh, I'll give you the building, just don't ask me for any money. And you know the mayor, but anyways, we, he did help us out. He did help us out, so I want to thank him for what he's done. But let me thank all of you for being here this evening. This is really a historical evening for us, and I want to welcome you all. Uh, we spent 15 years restoring this building. Um, 15 years, about $9 million, getting it back to its original form. Uh, and it's been just a labor of love. I've met my wife here during this whole 15 years. <laughs> and, uh, and so for all of us, it's just been a, a great, uh, great journey. And I'm so glad that tonight we're here and we're able to celebrate with not only you, but uh, part of Jen Jensen's family who is here with us tonight. And I want to welcome them. Let me mention to you that tonight, part of the family, we have Bruce Johnson and his wife, Dill. We have Christine Jensen Stuckel. Uh, we have Ryan Jensen. We have Ed Jensen. We have Robert Bruce Jen Johnson. And I just want to thank you all for making the trip and being here with us on this historical evening. <laughs> I do, before we go any further, want to call up um, Bruce Johnson. Um, and, and we just want to present you with uh, a little token of our appreciation for your family's work and for everything that you guys have done uh, with this place. So Mr. Bruce Johnson, this says, Humble Park, John Johnson's Living Laboratory, which is the name of our exhibit that we're opening up tonight. Uh, Chicago Architectural Biennial 2017, the National Museum of Puerto Rican Arts and Culture. Now you will, um, sure, yes, come on up, sir, <laughs> come on up. <laughs> you have to say a few words, feel free, I'm sure everybody here will welcome your remarks. <laughs> The fact that I'm his grandson had nothing to do with me. <laughs> but it's nice to have this uh, get together. I was really pleased when Julia invited me. It's nice to see you all. So before the evening is out, you really have to go to uh, Jen Jensen's office. Uh, we spent a lot of money restoring it back to its original form. And just so you know, it was done the right way. The preservation uh, people and the historical people said, no, you cannot use drywall in this office. You have to use plaster. <laughs> and, uh, and then the, the wood floors, they may look like just regular wood floors, but they actually had to be custom made. Each board could only be an inch and a quarter wide. So it's all done back to its original form. We try to do our best job. And thank you, Johnson family, for being with us here tonight. <laughs> I do want to uh, just acknowledge some of our board members who are here tonight. We have our board president, David Hernandez, uh, our vice president, Jaime Montezuma, 
We have with us, uh, he's going to be on the panel as well, Luis Martinez. Maria Concepcion is with us, and so is one of our Board of Trustees who lives out in Puerto Rico. Uh, but thank you for being here with us tonight, uh, Ray Vasquez. There are a couple people I do want to thank for their contributions to everything we've done here, and, um, and that is the Chicago Park District and uh, Chicago Park, Park Foundation. I think Willa is around here, so let me thank her as well. <laughs> Can TV is filming tonight, so you all better be on your best behavior. <laughs> Uh, they will let us know when they're going to air this, and we'll make sure we let all of you know. Uh, well, Can TV is here tonight. There is as well um, Marsha Kaufman. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Uh, Irving and uh, Marilyn, thank you for joining us as well. And then let me just thank uh, CAP, Chicago Architectural uh, Biennial. They have been just amazing in putting this year's. Uh, uh, exhibits together. They decided, Jack Guffman called me up about maybe eight months ago and said, hey, you know, the mayor's going to name me next week to be the chairman of Chicago Architectural Biennial. And I want to do something different this year. I want to have some anchor sites out in the communities. And so will you agree to be our first anchor site? And, you know, given the fact that we had Jen Chen Chen's office here, there was no way we could say no to it. But thank you, Chicago Architecture Foundation. Ashley, thank you so much for being here to represent them. Just give them a round of applause. <laughs> So let's uh, go ahead and get started. I think that we have a couple of exhibits here that we're opening as, far, as part of the Chicago Architecture Biennial. And one of them is the one that we're going to be discussing tonight, which is the Humboldt Park Jen Jensen's Living Laboratory. Uh, and we have a panel here that we're discussing that. And then in a few, we'll have a reception, um, um, kind of just to honor the opening of this exhibit. But we also have what you see in this room, which is the Humboldt Park State tables uh, to uh, transition into the future. And on this, we had quite a few partners. Uh, what we wanted to do with this was that we wanted to embrace everyone who has been part of Humble Park's community uh, before Puerto Ricans came to, into Humble Park. And so we have quite a few partners with us, and I do want to acknowledge all of them. Chicago History Museum, Chicago Cultural Alliance, Swedish, the Swedish Museum, uh, Denkhaus, the German Museum, uh, Ukrainian National Museum is also with us here in the house, Polish uh, National Museum, Casa Italia, Spartus Museum, Norwegian American Hospital, uh, Ukrainian Institute of Modern Art, and the Puerto Rican Cultural Center. What you see in this room is the beginning of a partnership between all of us. So this is the first part of it. Actually, we're going to make this our uh, part of our permanent exhibit. And then what we're going to do is update it like every six months. So we're going to be discussing different issues within all of those communities and how all those communities contributed to Humble Park and to the horse stables here. So we'll be discussing small businesses that were set up. We'll be discussing education that was done, uh, religion that took place in the community among all of us. So thank you all for being here. And let me also Thank Carl, who is here with the, the Humble Park Jen Jensen uh, Garden across the street. Let's go ahead and get started then. Uh, we have here tonight, as part of this panel, we have, let me first of all bring up Julia Backrack. Julia. <laughs> I don't know if I need to introduce Julia. You know, I was at a conference in Iowa, and everybody there knew her. There was this Danish museum, and I went to them and said, hey, we're looking to do this exhibit. And they said, and they said oh, well, we have this, and we have this. I said, wow, who did you work with? And they said, oh, this lady named Julia Backrack. And I was like, all right, so great. Thank you, Julia, for everything. But Julia was part of the park district for quite some time, and uh, she, um, she is now a historic uh, preservation consultant. Uh, she's written a few books. She's an author of, few, of quite a few books. 
And uh, she was one of the curators, along with Bianca Ortiz from our staff here, uh, on this exhibit that you're going to see. Um, she is um, uh, a person who we are very indebted to. When we thought about making this a museum, she came out and told us, because I was really going to make that off that room there, I was going to make that my office. <laughs> Then I found out it was a historical site and that it was Jen Jensen, so I had to move my office. <laughs> but Julia, welcome and thank you. Please have a seat with us. Uh, Luis Martinez. Uh, Luis Martinez has been, um, he has owned his own architectural consulting business for about 20 years now. Uh, he's been on the Chicago uh, Landmark Preservation, actually he received, and I did not know this, he's one of my board members, and I'm so embarrassed that I did not know this until today, uh, but he was named in 2017 one of the Chicago Landmark Preservation Excellence Awardees, and so Luis, thank you so much for everything you've done, um, and he has, uh, he's been the chief uh, architect for the Chicago City Colleges, and again, he is one of our board members, and I want to welcome Luis Martinez. <laughs> and next person on our panel is Gunny Harbo. Um, he has, since 2000, in 2008, he started off his own architectural uh, firm specializing in historical preservation and sustainable design. He has also uh, studied at the Royal Academy of Fine Arts in Copenhagen, Denmark. Uh, he also has a, a master's in science in historical preservation from Columbia University and Oh, and here, an AB in uh, history from Brown University. He, he was, he received, in 2010, he received the award um, for Chicago under the year by Chicago Magazine. And uh, oh, let me just like, skip all this, because he was past president of uh, architectural, what is it, architectural, it's, it's what is it? American Institute of Architectures. <laughs> He's their past president here in Chicago. Let me welcome Gunny Harbaugh to you. And so as we uh, uh, move forward here, let me ask Luis Martinez to go ahead and get us started here tonight. Good evening, everyone. Uh, what Billy didn't tell you is that he had to move his office to the women's bathroom. <laughs> But you, you should see it, though. It's really nice. <laughs> so, uh, you know, Mark Twain once said that the two most important days of your life is the day you were born and the day you find out why you were born. <laughs> and, um, you know, that's something that, you know, we're always looking at what makes our life meaningful. What is the legacy that we're going to leave behind? And in 1978, when I was doing my thesis in Champaign, I had to pick a project, and so I picked out a cultural center. A lot of it had to do with what was happening at the time. A lot of the dropout rate among Puerto Ricans was like 72 percent, and a lot of it was lack of self-esteem, pride, knowing where you came from, and just the whole concept of, uh, you know, who are you? Who are, you know, where did you come from? And so uh, in 1983, I was working at Skidmore, Owens & Merrill, and I got a phone call from the park district to assist in the boathouse in terms of restoring it, and they wanted to convert it to a museum. And uh, so that's where I got to meet Ed Euler at the time, who's right now he can't be with us because he's in the hospital. And uh, Julia, shortly after that, started working at the park district. So for me, you know, as, as I worked in the, in the boathouse, and then later on when Walter Nesh became president of the park district and happened to have been a partner at Skidmore, so I went to see him with a, gr a group of us, went to see him, and we presented the boathouse and so forth, and he said, you know what, this is really too small for you, for what you guys want to do, and if you think about the future. So take a look at this building, which was this building. And then he said, you know, when I went back, it's, they called and says, well, what did you think of it? I says, I'll take it. How much is it? He says, a dollar a year. I says, so, so then we started with the park district to restore the exterior, and then unfortunately in 1992 it caught fire. And from there, we kind of like sort of lost it, and the momentum kind of went away, and 
But the person that really restored that momentum back and then made the, made the possibility through also getting the funding, especially considering the building was built in 1895 for $68,000. And then now we've already spent $9 million this year, or this time. But Billy Ocasio was able to obtain that money and make this facility possible. So thank you, Billy. So, you know, something that I, I read was interesting was pastoral parks such as these were seen as beneficial to Chicagoans because they serve as the lungs of the city, providing places of natural beauty and relaxation that contrast sharply with the city's rapidly expanding urban streetscapes. As noted by architectural historian Daniel Bluestone, Victorian era Americans believed that parks offer psychological benefits to city dwellers through their separation from artificial scenes of commerce and contact with nature. Parks were also seen as cultivators of culture and democracy. In an increasingly capitalistic, class-oriented society, parks were also seen as cultivators of culture and democracy in an increasingly uh, classy, yeah, capitalistic, class-oriented society. So, you know, it, it really, you know, parks, a lot of times, you know, say, oh, you're spending how much on the restoring the gardens? And it's not about that. It's, it's what it does. You know, if you ever have an argument at home, just take a walk through the park. <laughs> and if you can, take it with your partner. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, you'll come out of there a completely different person. It's just amazing how the greenery just does those things to you. And that's what Jens Jensen saw. He, he sees it for, for more than what it's just a green plant. It's something that really instills your life and gives you thought and, and it just makes you excited about just being alive. And so I, you know, I've had the fortunate opportunity to be able to work with Julia and Gunny on various, on various projects, but this one in particular, um, just to, you know, that you think about the length of time that it took to restore it. But then here we are, and it's now very useful, and, and it's amazing how people come here, and just the sight, the scenery, it just does something. I mean, we have, I don't know how many weddings we have here a year, but it is, you know, obviously it has a, a place. So I just wanted to, um, I guess talk to Gunny about the restoring of the building itself. And, uh, you know, it's Freumann and Jepson. And Emil Freumann, uh, actually his father was an architect in Chicago. And uh, he went to MIT and then his father passed away and then Emil came back uh, to run the office and then it be and his good friend was Jepson who really was his anchor guy. And, that's, and they became one and they actually did the first uh, conservatory here. And um, so they, they really meant a lot. And then you, you probably know them more, like I always knew them more of all the Schlitz buildings that you yeah. see, the corner yeah. buildings yeah. with the globes on them. Yeah. That's, that's who they really. So anyway, so I'll open the floor to Gunny first. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, my involvement started here right after the fire. In fact, I remember, I remember coming on the, the park district had an RFP, which they always did, and uh, uh, you know, knew that this was an important building, but it was a mess. It, um, I think they'd lost over 50% of the roof had been consumed with fire. Fortunately, the whole building didn't wasn't destroyed, uh, but the the half timbered gables and things like that they had they had when the roof collapsed they fell out into this into the ground on the grounds in in front of the building basically around, um, which was great because that meant that the material didn't wasn't destroyed in the sense it didn't burn up but nonetheless it was there in a big pile on the on the ground and. Uh, it was also for me a personal thing because my heritage is Danish, and this is about as close to a Danish herko or manor house as I think I'll probably ever get to restore. Um, but the form of it and the, the the half timbering of it and a lot of the things about it were definitely reminiscent of what is a uh, very typical Danish architectural expression. Um, and. It isn't really clear, at least in the research I did, maybe you know more about Froman and Jepsen, but Jepsen probably was, a, was from Schleswig, uh, which at the time in the 19th century was, was part of Denmark uh, before they lost it to the Prussians in that horrible war. Anyway, um, 
so anyway, I had this personal connection to it because my father had come to uh, the States in 1948. And in fact, he assisted me uh, in a little archaeological dig because oh. we were trying to figure out, and I worked on this thing three different times, I think, yeah. because the funding was never what it should be. This is why these things take forever to do. Um, but anyway, we knew that there were, from the photographs, that there were these incredibly beautiful glazed tiles. Mm but there was no, no one had any of the glazed tiles. And we found the little shards here and there when you poked around in the grass in the, in the spring that they would rise to the top. So I asked my father if he would go down here with me on a, on a Sunday, and he said yes, and, in, and we were planning to do that. And the night before, and this sounds very weird, I don't know if I've ever told you this story, but uh, and I hadn't thought about it in a very long time, and it's the only time it's ever happened to me, but I actually had a dream. <laughs> And I dreamed that I found one of these elusive tiles. And I came out here that next day, and we were digging over in the corner right over here, and we found about three quarters of one of these tiles, which was very freaky. <laughs> But nonetheless, the good news was that it allowed us to make an exact replication of that very distinctive uh, uh, shingle, fish-scaled fish shingle tile that has an undulation and everything else. And the other thing about that is that in all my years of doing this restoration work, which is nearing 30 years, that's the first time ever that we asked a fabricator to make something uh, you know, here's, here's what we want, can you make this? And the first time it came out, it was exactly right. Wow. And that was, that, it's never happened since then either, yeah. And it was made by the same company that made the original ones, Ludoisi Tile in Ohio. Uh, so anyway, it was a long journey. It was, the, the first stage was just to, just to get the thing um, stabilized. And we, it was actually the, the, um, the uh, envelope of the building was built with plywood and so on. I don't know if you remember that stage. It was a, not, it was a very ugly stage. Uh, and then more funding came through and we were able to actually execute the entire exterior restoration, which was done very skillfully by a great group of different contractors. And um, it, it still looks great now. And that was completed, when, in 99 or, when, I don't even remember, 98, I guess. So it's been 20 years mm -hmm. since, the, since the outside was done. Um, anyway, it was, it was a lot of fun uh, on many different levels. And one, one fortunate thing is all the windows from the building had been removed by the contractor prior to the fire occurring, which did happen under suspicious well, was it? It was arson. Yeah, it was arson. We don't know who lit it, but you know. But the, it was a low bid contractor. Yeah. But fortunately, all these, all the, all the uh, wood windows had been removed. So those are all the original wood windows. They weren't destroyed in the fire, and that was one of the silver linings, I guess. Uh, and I'm just happy to see it being used and and uh, to put it into good use. And the and the connection to the to the uh, community is a great thing because, of course, this was a Scandinavian, Scandinavian community in those days, and then these things change. And I love the fact that you identify all that in the, in the, um, in the timeline. It's a very nice way to say, you know, how a, a very important neighborhood of Chicago has, has evolved and changed and still connects back to all the things that made it into what it is today. And I think that the idea of having these programs uh, over si every six months, I think it's a wonderful idea. So congratulations on getting it finally to this point. And uh, I'm really happy to be here. And I'm going to pass it off to Julia, but happy to answer questions when we get to that point. Thank you. Well, I have to kind of begin a little bit about Ed Euler because he really wanted to be here tonight. And, um, and some of you know him and some of you don't. But um, uh, so I, I bought this card because I thought since he missed, he missed this experience that it would be so fun for him to get a card from all of you. So if you wouldn't mind signing his card and just passing it around, I think that would mean a lot to him. And for those of you who don't know him, you know, he's the person who um, really brought us Millennium Park. He just recently retired as the director of Millennium Park. Um, but so I just want to kind of explain that uh, Ed Euler
he hired me to work uh, as a consultant for the Chicago Park District in um, 1988, and then they hired me as an actual staff person in 1989. And um, so he, it was really just a phenomenal opportunity for me. And of course, at that point, um, we had Will Tippins, who is um, an architect who um, did his master's thesis under Dan Bluestone, um, where he documented all of the um, historic plans and drawings of the park district. Well, not all of them, but some of the really significant ones. And um, so Ed, um, he, he really is kind of an a amazing person. But um, when, he, I, when he hired me and, and Will, he was the head of the Park District, and it was just the beginnings of the reform era, and of course Walter Netsch was um, on the board. And so at that point, um, the Park District gave, uh, they had a rule that every project went to the low bid contractor. And so he, Ed had put together a department, and this is before, you you before luckily we were able to get Gunny involved, but the, uh, Ed had a, some preservation architects who did some construction documents for the building, it went to the low bid contractor, and I remember well um, the the day that it, the evening that it burned down. Everybody was calling each other. We were crying, and um, so the building, I, if I remember correctly, I think they tarped the roof. I'm not sure how soon you got involved, Gunny, but the building went for two full seasons without really a proper roof. And so Ed asked me, and as Gunny, Gunny said, there were many different iterations of trying to get funding. But I don't know if you remember, under President Clinton, there was the ice, these ice tea grants. And Ed asked me to write an ice tea grant for this building. And um, so one of the things that would kind of bring a project up to the top was if it was a pro property on the National Register. And I had done the National Register nomination, which had already happened. But I, it had to be connected to transportation. That's the T in the ice tea. And I said, Ed, I don't understand. How am I going to write? Write this as a transportation grant, and he said, "Well, you're the one who's always talking about the historic boulevards, isn't that transportation? Just write about the historic boulevards and how that beautiful arched opening was, so they could bring carriages in here, and those things, those things in there, those are horse stalls. Just write about that." And I said, "Okay." <laughs> So I'm sure it took many, many efforts of many people to bring in the money, but my little part of it was writing that iced tea grant. So um, anyway, and it, it certainly felt good to do something about this building that seemed to be languishing at the time, and it's so exciting now to be here. And I was so thrilled um, when Billy gave me the opportunity to work with Bianca, who is amazing, Bianca Ortiz back here, who did all of the design of the exhibit. And I don't know if I should tell you guys how quickly we had to put that all together. Um, the, the room in there, I, I, I wasn't, Bianca also designed all of this, but I wasn't involved in this part of the exhibit, but the, the, all of the stuff about Jensen. And um, I, for, I, this is a project on the back burner, um, so you know maybe um, in the next 20 years I will finish, but I had started a uh, historical fiction novel about the story of Jensen living across the street from the park with his family, and the story opened up on the day, the night before he's about to get fired in 1900. And of course, you guys, most of many of you know me, I had to figure out the exact day when Jensen got fired. So um, as you know, you guys know the best, many of you know, and if you don't, you'll find out from the exhibit, Jens and Anna Marie left Denmark because they were in love and the family didn't approve of the marriage. They felt she was beneath his station in life and as Bruce will tell you, um, he would have had a hard time t uh, taking over the family business. Jens was the oldest of five children, right? And uh, they had, they owned a lot of land and um, he had different ideas about how they should manage the family's sort of agricultural holdings. So they ran away to America and they were a little bit in Iowa and Florida, but they came to Chicago and um, he, he, had, he got a job in a soap factory. And it was horrible. He hated it. I don't know how they made soap back then, but I don't think I want to know. <laughs> 
And so when he had the opportunity to be hired basically as a street sweeper for the West Park Commission, it was very exciting for him. But you know, this guy, he had a college degree, he had um, you know, some training, kind of agricultural kind of training, and he, he didn't look at it as something that was beneath him. He thought this was fantastic that he'd be able to work outside on parks. And so, um, so he began working his way up. And it's funny, I can't even remember, Bianca, all the things we included and we didn't. But I think we included the first time he gets published in the annual reports for the West Park Commission is for designing this rake, aquatic rake thing that would be kind of dragged by a boat to get the aquatic weeds out of the lagoons. And um, so he's being sort of recognized for his efforts. And it's a lot of experimentation. And he gets promoted first to being the superintendent of Union Park, at, which is a much smaller park. But of course, that's where the commissioners had their offices. That's where he planted the American Garden. Then he gets promoted to being the superintendent of Humboldt Park in 1895, as they're building this building. He got to be the first guy to occupy the corner office. I mean, that was just, that must have been an amazing thing for a guy who had gotten excited about being able to sweep up manure instead of working in a soap factory, <laughs> right? And um, so I, I, I've been working on this, um, this uh, historical fiction novel, but it starts with the day that he's sitting in his office in 1900, and the superintendent of the parks comes to tell him he's out. And the reason he's out is because he's been doing too good of a job. And he is, I don't know if he was idealistic or naive, or if he just thought he's just going to kind of push things as far as he can and see what he can get away with. But he's trying to blow the whistle on all of this political graft that's going on in 1900. And all the commissioners were in on it. And so, you know, he's supposed to sign off on these short orders of coal. Probably some, but somebody's brother-in-law worked for the coal company. And then some contractor does some shoddy work on sidewalks. And he makes them come back and do it again. And so he gets fired. And so I just keep thinking about the family with four children living across the street. And you'll, you'll notice in the exhibit that when he did this little um, lily pond right outside of the building here, he had these beautiful lilies and he tested out the lily by setting his own daughter on the lily pad. But at any rate, he goes through four difficult years of struggle. And you'll see in the exhibit that the family lived within walking distance of the park all of those years. So I just think what that must have been like to be living right by the park and see your, the, you know, the people that were your, um, that had to report to you, all the laborers and people who worked at the park. You know, as you'd walk by the park, you'd see all these guys working in the park who had been reporting to him. And now he's just barely making it. Um, Got to get food on the table. But then uh, in 1905, the, the, a reform-minded governor um, kicks out the entire corrupt board of commissioners and appoints a new and progressive board. And they say, we need a man who knows everything about parks and nothing about politics. And that would be Jens Jensen. So he then gets an opportunity. They give him a $2 million uh, bond issue, which was worth over $50 million at the time, to redesign the parks. And you know some of that is included in there as well. So this park is a really special place to Jensen. And I was so excited that the Jensen family wanted to be here. And and I'm just thrilled that you, uh, that all of you are here. And Bianca tells me that the exhibit's not leaving anytime soon. So I think that was probably more than you needed to hear from me. But no, thank you. So, so actually, where we're sitting right now is actually where 16, up to 16 horses you can have in this space. So when I first came here, there was a water trough over here, two sliding doors, and then. So you can sort of see the blacksmiths were on the right side. And so it was a very interesting building. And then if you think about 1895, what was going on. But uh, you know, I just want to open it up for questions. And uh, you know, just for you to know that the park, you know, it's, it's 207 acres of land. They did the east side first, which was 80 acres, and then the west side. A lot of that had to do with the fire of 1871. 
And, uh, and obviously with 1893 with the World Columbian Exhibition is what really drew a lot of incredible brainstorming. People like Daniel Burnham and William LeBaron Jennings actually was the architect slash engineer for the West Park System. So then later on you know him as designing the first skyscraper in the world. And, uh, and obviously you have Jens Jensen, then you got Daniel Burnham, and then you got Olmsted doing some things in Chicago as well. So there's a lot of incredible, today, you know, back then they were just John and Charlie. <laughs> so today, anyway, so any questions? Yes? I have a question. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got the community that's here now involved in this project? Um, well, it's, yeah, primarily the, uh, well, the Portland community has been, after, you know, they've been trying to get a museum for a long time. And we have, you'll see a lot of cultural centers throughout the city. It's, you know, the Puerto Rican Cultural Center, you'll see Chris Belvis, and so there's, but you know, most of them are in storefronts or small. And so we wanted to have a place that was more of a national museum, which is what this is. And it's the only Puerto Rican national museum in the country right now. New York had one, but they no longer do. Um, so it is quite, uh, but the community have always wanted something, but the problem has always been the funding source, obviously, and the ideas, and someone to come up with the concept, you know, come up, draw it all up first, then you can energize people to actually be behind something that, that's there. And then you gotta get, of course, Billy Ocasio, who was the alderman at the time, and then you get Congressman Luis Gutierrez as well to support it. So obviously you gotta get the community first to support it, and then you gotta get the politicians to be behind it, and then you gotta find hopefully a donor or Uncle Sam that's very wealthy or so forth. Um, but that's, you know, that's pretty much, um, a lot of ideas come up, a lot of it is, you know, there's a need. Um, obviously, uh, in this case, it's, you know, how do we get these kids off the streets? You know, how do we get individuals who are extremely talented, skilled um, in various areas, and how do we display that talent? And then so that they can then show the other kids, and they can be encouraged to, you know, rather than being on the streets and so forth. I mean, obviously, Humboldt Park is known also for baseball, and now there's a soccer field. And uh, so you'll see a lot of that activity occurring, um, but it, it's more than just that. It's just getting them involved in interacting and helping each other, and then getting them involved in programs, such as the museum here, and volunteering. Yes? Yes? Which horse is rewarded here? Well, so the park, and it's interesting, quite often, I mean, this wasn't the oldest building in the park, but quite often the, the older buildings in the parks would be stables because they needed to stable the workhorses. So the park itself, the park commission, would own some, some horses. And then when you look at the historic plans, they had hitching places. And, and you'll see that, you know, pretty well into the 19 teens. You'll see the hitching places. So, um, so I, I've never read any specifics about what you had to do if you wanted to sort of pull up your carriage in here, uh, but I'm, I feel quite certain that the reason that that arch opening is so big is because not only would you be pulling in the, the horse, but you know, carriages and wagons, the architect probably knows for sure. <laughs> Uh, we never, no, we never really able to determine that other than it was a place for the park district's uh, workhorses and, and the sheds were all full of equipment and it was, it was a working building and then, then the offices, there were a few offices on this wing, that was the idea. And the, the name of the building was always the Stables and Receptory. I love the Victorian names. And Receptory, which is different than Refectory, um, is where you'd be received. Um, so I always kind of thought of this sort of grand experience of, you know, it's a very sort of utilitarian building, and yet, you know, every park building of the era would be beautiful, and you'd have this kind of arrival experience. It, it, was, all, it was also very iconic. There are m many, many different uh, post 
postcard views of this building. So it, yeah. was, a, it was a place that people um, would come to, and I don't know if they came on horseback or walk, but nonetheless, they would come and they would recreate here. They would have picnics and things like that, very simple things. But they had very fond memories of it. And if you go to any postcard uh, swap or sale or whatever, and you look for things of Chicago, you'll, you'll quite possibly find a picture of Humboldt Stable. Yeah, and one of the things you will read about is that um, you, you can come to Humboldt Park and get carriage rides, horse riding, uh, boats, uh, canoeing. So there was various recreational activities other than just, you know, a lot of the parks were designed, it was promoted by developers. If you want to create development in an area, you have to give them some kind of incentive or amenity. A park is a huge amenity back in the 1800s. And so then once you get the park, then people start moving in and building construction and so forth. So that was a big stimulation. Here's a question. You, know, you mentioned finding all kinds of things here. If you have a place here where they're on exhibit, which you did find, you know, tools you said. No, I mean, there was, as far as the uh, artifacts from what was here, I mean, when Billy mentioned it, when I, when I, the first time I came here, the sheds that were at that end were piled high with blue salt that had been sitting in there for, and which is like the worst thing you could possibly do to masonry building. Um, and in fact, they had, there was a lot of, uh, dealing with that that had to be addressed. But there wasn't, there weren't, I mean, there might have been some things in the, you know, uh, anchors in the walls or things like that, but there was no real collection of tools or anything like that. So what kind of the, well, I just want to say the one thing I know that was found here was one of those Tico Ware urns oh, yeah. that was at the, remember? And the, uh, there were dozens and dozens of them throughout the park and especially in the formal garden. Um, and that was the only one that was still left. And it was here in the building. And Worth a ton of money. <laughs> <laughs> we don't talk about that. <laughs> Tico pot that was six feet tall or something. It's at the park district in the archives. Somebody over here? Cool. Uh, I live just three blocks from the park, and uh, it's wonderful to walk by the ferry stream mm -hmm. and through the seasons because you can watch it change seasonally. It's mm -hmm. just really nice to have in the neighborhood. But I'm wondering if it's, um, it was called Jensen's Laboratory, and in what sense was it, was it a laboratory? Well, I kind of made that up, and we sort of used that for the exhibit, Jens Jensen's Living Laboratory, because um, he, when he, when he worked here first in 1890, between 95 and 1900, and then he didn't work in the park, in this park, but he then was in charge of redesigning all of the parks um, in, be, between 1905 and 1910. Um, out of all of the work that he did, and I've spent a lot of time um, writing about and analyzing and nominating these parks, um, the work that he did in this park was the most experimental. And so you brought up the Prairie River. Um, and he used that terminology, Prairie River. It, that wasn't something that we made up. That's, he called it the Prairie River. And um, you know, at that time, and many of us are very interested in prairie-style architecture. They they didn't call prairie style architecture prairie style. So he made all of these references about the indigenous landscape and how he wanted to celebrate this sort of Midwestern landscape. And that was, you know, the, the plan that you'll see in the room that he did was 1907. I mean, that is really, really early for kind of experimenting with these ideas. Um, and so later you see him continuing to develop the Prairie River, the use of native plants, his um, indigenous stone, he would use the local stone and he would you get, use it in um, very horizontal um, layers where you can't see the mortar. So many of the ideas that he continues on and he lived to be 91 years old. And so he used these, you can see these ideas being repeated in um, places like Columbus Park, but then in his private um, designs, he worked for both, both uh, Henry Ford and Edsel Ford, he did these incredible estates 
And, um, you know, as I said, his work he went on for decades. So many of the ideas that become his signature design elements, uh, he, uh, he started with a kind of an experimentation process here in Humboldt Park. And in doing this exhibit, I, I've done a lot of work on Jensen, and I curated an exhibit on him at the Cultural Center, maybe some of you remember from back in 2001. But I really, and we didn't have a lot of time, and Bianca was amazing. But I wanted to do something that was really specific to Humboldt Park. I thought this this is the opportunity that I may never have again because it got very granular. You know, uh, what other site would I be able to look at all the different apartments where the family lived right across the street from the park? But in doing so, um, and, and the, the research that you can do today that I couldn't do back in 2001, the things I could find. So I was just, I was telling the Jensen family here that one of the things that excited me the most is that I recently, I do a lot of searching, I do a lot of searching on Google Books, I do a lot of searching on a website called Hathi Trust. And so I do lots and lots of different search terms. I, I'll, you know, if I'm looking at a corner, um, you know, 68th and uh, Cornell, I'll put it in as 68th and Cornell, and then I'll switch it and say Cornell and 68th and find entirely different stuff. So all of a sudden, I started searching. I noticed he occasionally, he, he was Anglo sizing his name in the uh, 1890s as James Jensen, but I noticed he would occasionally do J-A-S, James as Jazz Jensen. So I started on these websites, this is like the easiest thing anybody could do, putting in, in quotation marks instead of James Jensen or Jens Jensen or just Jensen, I put in Jazz Jensen, and suddenly I found this whole treasure trove of all of these articles that were published in the late 1890s when he worked here because I found out that he was a correspondent for two national gardening magazines, meaning he was writing articles once a week for two national magazines. And much of it was the experimentation he was doing here in this park. These were very practical kinds of advice kinds of columns. Um, so that's, hopefully I've made a good defense for why it should be his living laboratory. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, yes? What's the progress with the rehabilitation of the wildflower garden? Well, we have we've got Carl here. <laughs> Carl, you want to? Would you like to say something? Because we have a there's a great website and people can donate money. We don't hate to miss hate to miss a chance. Uh, a couple of years ago, I lived on the street with my wife and him, and uh, wandered around this park for a number of years, and it gets more and more entrancing and um, I don't know relieving every time I do it. So um, I was invited by a group of community gardeners to attend a meeting to talk about the restoration of the formal garden in the park. And that's when we met Julia, who flew the flag, and we all learned, as I recall. So we started hosting a monthly meeting to try to figure out how to um, make it happen, try to figure out what the parameters of the process were and what we could do. We got a certain way through that, and we found some partnerships with the um, Garden Conservancy, which is a large organization on the East Coast that largely manages uh, <coughs> excuse me, private gardens. So this being an urban um, public garden is kind of a new experience for them. They had some great advice, experience, and connections, and we wandered through a path that led us to uh, securing the services of Pete Udolph, um, who is known for doing the Lurie Garden here, and the Highline in New York, and a few other things. So he's on board. Um, there is a plan that this, this park district has, and it's got a budget associated with it. I think there's some um, nuances that need to be worked through on that yet. And there's a campaign to start raising some money, I think is going to be happening in earnest at the top of the year in 2018. Again, JesselFormalGarden.com is the website. Um, if you want to submit your email, you can check the list. There's social media stuff as well. Um, we're hopefully going to do some more programs to highlight it because of the uh, temporary arts um, that's in the garden this summer. Um, I believe I have some of the programs for that as which I didn't put out. Is that, is that still in the garden? So the garden is a year-long thing, so we're kind of curious to see what happens with the winter. Um, we have some for that. There's postcards and some pins uh, on the bar as well. And that will have some more contact information on it. So hope that answers your question. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. Any, any other uh, questions? No? Well, thank you for coming. And Billy, thank you.
Let me, before we adjourn, let me just say that um, we just found out today, so November 18th, we are going to be hosting um, what's called the CAB, uh, Chicago Architecture Biannual Teen Studio here. Uh, we're going to partner up uh, some architects with, uh, with students, high school students. Uh, and so they're going to have a three hour workshop here done. Uh, and so I'm not sure who the architects are going to be. They may be reaching out to you guys, but uh, word just came down today. So it'll be a great partnership for us in this community. Let me also say that we are, um, we have another exhibit upstairs if you want to take the elevator. It's beautiful exhibit done uh, by Port Puerto Rican artists from Orlando, Florida. Uh, beautiful, beautiful exhibit. Uh, this place has become really a dream for this community, and so I want to thank you all, because I know that in one way or another, all of you have contributed to this, and I really want to thank our panel because they have. I mean, they have been here, as Julia said, from day one. I know Luis was here, and he was part of the first board that said, let's make this a museum, and they saw this place burn down. And so I want to thank you guys for not only being there in the beginning, but for bringing us here today. So thank you, and give them a round of applause.